Well, good afternoon, and thanks for joining us for the real truth behind sprain and strains and are your employees actually fit for duty? So I don't think that I've ever met a safety representative, a HR representative, a supervisor, employer, et cetera, that could ever tell me with a straight face that, that some of these brain strain injuries are never a challenge for them. So I'm tickled that you're here. Uh, we've got some great information that we're going to be able to share, not just about the injuries themselves, but also on ways that you can kind of mitigate that risk in the very beginning. So for those of you who may be new, my name is Holly Foxworth. I am a registered nurse. I'm also the marketing manager for content here at Axia Medical. I'm also joined by Dr. Tom Gillum, which is with IPCS, and then also we have Axiom's Chief Medical Officer, uh, Chief Marketing Officer, we always call you the, the different M, Dara, um, Dara Wheeler. So I'll have them both introduce themselves momentarily. But before we do pass that baton over, I did want to show you guys something that I wanted to get your, your bring your attention to. So if you'll look at your screens, so do it with me right now. So look at your screen, look at the top right-hand side, and so right there is where you will see the information for our next webinar. Um, so this one actually is going to be it's really interesting because uh, this is naturally going to be the, the 20 year anniversary of what's going on with 9-11 tragedy that, that we all experienced then. And so we're not only going to kind of give reference to that and, and review the pieces that are that are included in that, but also um, look at the PTSD side of it and, and some of the lives that have been lost, the wellness lives that were lost because of the tragedy that occurred. So we're going to have uh, military veterans there. We'll have some of our public uh, service there, and we will go through all the different components that are included, not just the diagnosis, but also the event, and really kind of give recognition there. And also talk about how it is that, that you in the workplace can overcome some of these things and how it is that we can kind of come together, rebuild, and um, get things back on track there. So if you haven't already, press that button. It says register now. You don't have to enter any additional information with what's already there, just press that. It's gonna get your registration, we'll send it to you. And then it's already on your calendar and you'll be ready to roll for, for the following um, uh, event. So one other thing, we definitely always ha obviously have the resources that are located there at the bottom. That's the one that has the widget that looks like books. Um, and so there you'll find all the different white papers. So there's everything from the, how it is that you can start a vaccination program now that we officially have a um, an FDA clearance for that vaccination that's there how it is that you can manage um, flu during the pandemic season. So there's lots of good information there. All of it's free, and, and you're welcome to anything that's there. So I think that that probably covers the majority of everything that we wanted to talk about in the beginning. And now I'm going to go ahead and kind of pass that over. I'm going to let Dr. Gillum first start, introduce yourself, tell us your name and where you're from, and then we'll go on mm -hmm. to Darren, and then we'll get started. Dr. Gillum, do you want to, you want to kick us off here? Sure will. Uh, thanks, Holly. And uh, again, hi, Dara, to you too. I'm Tom Gilliam. Um, my training background, I have a doctorate, a PhD degree in exercise physiology, muscle physiology, which I got many, many years ago from Michigan State University. And then I was also a, for many years a tenured faculty member at the University of Michigan. Got involved with industry in the late 80s, early 90s, started doing muscular strength testing with industry then uh, resigned from the University of Michigan and then formed my own company called IPCS or Industrial Physical Capability Services in 1998. We are located in Hudson, Ohio between Cleveland and Akron and um, I'm the um, founder and owner of that company. Fantastic. Well, thanks for joining us today. We appreciate it. Dara, let me uh, push things in your direction. Give us a, a quick overview. Thanks, Holly. I'm happy to be here. My name is Dara Wheeler. I'm Axiom's Chief Marketing Officer, the other M. And I have been with Axiom for a little over 15 years. I'm very, very um, excited to have Tom here. We've worked for years with him and, and are looking to continue this partnership. Of course, uh, post-COVID uh, uh, experience has been a, an interesting one, but we're getting back to thinking again about the physical capabilities of, of workers and employees and how we can support them and maintaining that health as they are employed um, throughout their life cycle. So really excited to chat with Tom about that today. Thank you, Holly. Yeah, you bet, absolutely. Well, Tom, I'll go ahead and just kind of get started with you. So talk to us through these these three little um, initials that we see that are always coming up here for, for the MDS, and then what does that actually mean? Well, uh, Holly, I 
I went back and I looked at the Bureau of Labor Statistics. What is their definition of musculoskeletal disorders? So I want to just give that brief definition, which will talk a little bit about the ergonomic injuries, the uh, infrequent activity, and, and the uh, overexertion injury. According to the BLI, uh, BLS, the musculoskeletal disorder sometimes called the ergonomic injury, occurs when the body uses muscles, tendons, ligaments to perform tasks, oftentimes in awkward positions or in frequent activities, which over time can create pain and injury. Overexertion and repetitive motion are the primary causes of these injuries. The reason why I wanted to read that to the people is that, in my opinion, um, one very important thing is left out of what really causes a muscular a skeletal disorder. And that is what is the physical capability of the, of the worker? My experience over the last 30, 40 years in industry is that many injuries occur because a company will hire someone and try to place them into a job that physically they cannot do. They may have a pre-existing condition that the company doesn't know about. And so they're put onto the ramp to unload planes or something like that. And within four or five days, they've got themselves uh, rotator cuff injury. So n not only is it caused by the overuse of the muscle tendons and ligaments, that is a big contribution, but um, getting that right person in the right job is critical in terms of managing uh, or even uh, preventing uh, musculoskeletal uh, disorders. Wow. You start talking about those, Darren, that's our love language, isn't it? When we're talking about the, the preventing some of these that occur and on and what the, the impact is, there is. So talk to us then about how it is that, I mean, do you feel like that that, that we're seeing a lot of consistency as, as you look at the different industries, is it by geographic location? Are you seeing any new trends? What what are your thoughts there? Well, there's there was some good trends and uh, those trends have leveled off. Um, we, we see about 890,000 non-fatal injuries um, that re result in days away from work or work-related in injuries. Um, and, and of those 890,000, about 295,000 of them are actual musculoskeletal injuries. Um, and as a uh, slide shows, about 33% of those 295,000 injuries of days away from work injuries are, are restraints and sprains. And if you add in muscle soreness and pain, which is part of the definition, um, the uh, strain, sprains, muscle pain, soreness accounts for 51% of all these um, uh, musculoskeletal injuries that occur each year. Now, what, about 10, 12 years ago, we were seeing about 330, 340,000 of these injuries a year. And it has been lowered to about 290, 295, but it's it's leveled off for the last three or four years. And so when you see that, you have to begin to ask the question, why is that happening? Um, we've done a tremendous job with um, uh, safety programs, with ergonomic programs, with automation, uh, robots to help alleviate the, uh, the, the physical demands of the job. But yet we still see a lot of these musculoskeletal injuries occurring. And when we looked at the uh, top four industries, and this is based on the frequency of injury, uh, the healthcare worker is number one, uh, retail trade is number two, manufacturing is number three, and then transportation warehousing is number four. But the number in the parentheses is, is the median number of days away from work and you can see it's almost just the opposite. Even though the healthcare has the highest frequency of injury, uh, they have the lowest days away from work compared to transportation warehousing, where you're, uh, they're number four in terms of their frequency, but they average, or not average, their median number of days away from work is 26. That's almost, a, well, it's more than a month in terms of working days as far as the type of injuries. So they tend to have the more serious um, injury uh, as far as a musculoskeletal injury uh, is concerned. Hmm. And so, and I didn't ask you about this before, but just kind of thinking through it now, do you feel like that that's, that the majority of those are from leaning forward and then trying to lift on things? Or, or do you have, a, have any thoughts about how those are actually occurring in those industries? I have a lot of thoughts on how those are occurring. <laughs> 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 uh, 
Um, what we'll see with my presentation, we're, we're going to look at what's happening to the worker uh, in the last 15 years in terms of their physical fitness, in terms of their muscular strength. And it's not good news, um, Holly and, and Dara. It, it's the, the selection process that you have. If you, if you have a company that you have physically demanding jobs, um, it's harder to find someone who really has the capability to safely perform those essential functions of the job. And so, uh, you know, as we go through the presentation today, I'll show you some hard evidence that the worker is weaker today, the worker's more obese, um, and all that is contributing to uh, the increase or at least not any further decrease in these musculoskeletal injuries. And now you throw in there what well, we're just coming off of the, the COVID-19. And again, there's a lot of research coming out here now that basically says that worker is uh, at higher risk for injury and disease because of what we just went through. And that was primarily the lockdown. Yeah, definitely. Talk to us then about kind of the frequency and the cost. I, you know, I'll tell you that whenever yeah. I was writing in some of the, the research that was there, my jaw dropped whenever I saw that, that they were saying that for anything that's a medically consulted injury, that I mean, you're looking at a price mm -hmm. tag that's over like $40,000. I mean, that's huge. Yep. <laughs> I, I, it definitely yeah. got my attention. Is that what you're finding with, with some of these others as well? Yeah, it, it's a big injury. Uh, it's a big cost factor. And um, it, again, th these are uh, from the National Safety Council um, uh, in terms of uh, injuries, in terms of frequency, looking at strains and sprains. And that's um, showing that 21% of all the musculoskeletal injuries involving the lower back is, is the number one. I don't necessarily agree with that, but that's what the data says. And I'll tell you why in just a moment. Uh, the shoulders at 15% of all the injuries and 10% for the knees, 5% for the wrists. Um, the type of industries that we work with are very physically demanding types of jobs. And when I talk to these people, uh, and this started in about maybe 2005, um, our clients or prospective clients would say, you know, uh, that shoulder seems to be the number one injury that we're seeing in our workplace today. And uh, more and more companies have said that. Um, and, and certainly what the data shows on the left hand, on the right hand side, excuse me, when you look at the average strain sprain cost, shoulders are the number one at $46,000, then by the back, the low back of 37 and the knees at 33 and the wrists at 25. But a lot of companies today, particularly those with physically demanding jobs again, the number one industry and uh, number one injury is the shoulder and also the most costly injury uh, is the shoulder. Many, many years ago, I had a conversation with a person uh, with American Airlines and uh, that individual stated to me that their number one injury on the, uh, on the ramp is the, in terms of frequency was the shoulder and it was more costly than the low back. So um, again, what we're seeing, as I said earlier, we're seeing a, d a deterioration in the overall strength of the worker um, and that's contributing more to the uh, shoulder cost than it is to the low back cost and the frequency of the claim. Okay. And, and uh, before we get to this next one, I'll just kind of bring Derek in here as well. And, and Derek, you may want to want to expand upon this. But I mean, this, whenever you start talking about days away from work, that's one of the first conversations that that come up with some of the clients that we see. You know, I mean, that's a that's a big target that's there. And everybody wants to know why it is that, that we need to decrease that number, how you can decrease that number. Um, but then also the impact of that when you have employees that are out, once they go out, it's hard to get them back in. Yeah, I could take a, the start and then Tom can jump in. But yeah, I, I agree with what you're saying, Holly. Um, what we find is in the, you know, the, the years and years of doing this, that the more we can do to keep employees on the job, the better for them and their health, the better for the overall financial health of the employee and, and for the employer. Um, we, you're correct that the more an employee is away from work, the, the much harder it is to return them to work. And there's a, a host of reasons around that. Um, we've seen, we see that in um, both work-related and non-work-related illnesses and looking at any time an employee is out on disability or work-related injury, the, the more they're out, the, the harder it is to really return them. Um, and so that's why thinking about programs that either catch or, or work with employers 
to look at this on the front end, like Tom described from a pre-employment standpoint, or, or looking at programs that minimize the impact if they do have to have days away and returning them to work even in little, limited capacity is a really great way of managing um, injuries and, and thinking about these overall programs. Yeah, definitely. So, Tom, talk to us about. I'm sorry. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, I was going to ask you about this about whenever we were talking about those body parts. So, you know, I had noticed that that you'd put in there that the shoulder really was that 28 days where you've got like back that would be at seven. So, do you feel like that it's specifically because of the interventions that have to be done to to fix the injury to kind of rehab that, or where where do you think that that difference comes in? Well, I, I think, yes, uh, the, sh the shoulder is a very complicated uh, joint um, and a rotator cuff injury. But people tell you if, you, if you have surgery on your shoulder, uh, it could take up to one year for full rehabilitation. Um, and meanwhile, on the back, uh, the surgical procedures, or if you have to have surgery, I should say, are uh, so, so much better these days that doing them uh, microscopically, um, and sometimes in and out in one day, um, and you're back to work in, in seven days or, or less, um, and unless you're uh, doing a fusion or, or something like that. So the procedure uh, themselves have improved as far as taking care of the back when surgery is involved. However, with the shoulder, it's just a, a complicated joint that if you're repairing a rotator cuff and it's a, it's a very serious rotator cuff injury, it's weeks before that you have to have your arm immobilized and then you can begin to s start slowly with your physical therapy. And then it just takes a while to get your strength back before you get your range of motion back. Um, and before you know it, six months has gone by, then when you do come back to work, you might be able to go back in a modified assignment, but it's gonna be uh, almost a whole year before that shoulder is gonna be back to where you can perhaps do what you were doing prior to the injury. So yeah, we, we do see that happening, uh, Holly, today where, um, and, and this is one of the reasons why the shoulder has become one of the worst joints as far as median days away from work. Um, but um, looking over to the left there, what really astonishes me when they looked at all the days away from work for musculoskeletal disorders, in 2019, that's 70 million days. Um, that's a lot of days. Of course, that's a lot of injuries. There's a lot of workers off. And I don't have a number, but people in the HR business knows when they lose a worker for a period of time, not just because of injury, there's a ton of indirect costs. And um, Dara, you, you may have some of these, these numbers yourself in dealing with your, your clients. Um, but when you factor that in, you're looking at billions of dollars lost because of injuries, particularly musculoskeletal disorders, many, not all, but many of which could be pre prevented. And we'll, we're gonna talk about that in just a little bit. Yeah, definitely. And, and uh, we didn't put it here, but um, Dara, what is it? Is it that the OSHA calculator? Is that what we found at that time that there's actually a calculator where you could put in what, what your injury was and it would calculate and come up with some of those different indirect costs. So, I mean, if you're, if anybody's interested, I think that they do have that that uh, tool that's available on their website. Yeah, I think yeah. OSHA yeah. and the Department of Labor, yeah, have that yes. um, have that uh, calculator and, and it's consistent with the numbers that the Tom's got up here. It's um, it's star it's staggering, um, and I and he's right. The HR departments know very well that it's not just that direct cost. It's all the indirect costs and turnover and replacement costs and having to train people to to do the jobs. And there's just there's a lot of expense around um, injuries and people being away from work. Yeah. Sure. Not to mention well, culturally. Yeah, <laughs> Sorry, exactly. Holly. Yeah, for sure. Now, so Tom, is, I guess I guess the next question becomes then. So, if we have all of, we have all these advances in in medicine, we know more about the body than we've ever known before. We have all of these mm -hmm. different components. So then, why is it that we're still facing some of these same risks that that um, are occurring with these multiple injuries that, that take place on a daily basis? Well, I think we we know of. A four or five uh, very good reasons why these musculoskeletal injuries are still around. Um, and I wanna talk about these because industry doesn't seem to, uh, they, they don't pay much attention to them. I think they, they're concerned, but they don't pay much attention to them because unfortunately, what, what I'm gonna talk about now is happening. Uh, with th these four factors right here, you've got the aging workforce, 
um, the muscular, uh, the, the, the weakness in, in the muscles, uh, obesity, and now the uh, COVID lockdown. But when you look at the aging workforce and what uh, uh, Darius just was talking about uh, as well, um, what happens so many times in trying to get a worker back to work, it's difficult. And the older the worker is, the more difficult it is to get that worker back to work. Um, for example, many 60-year-olds who have a musculoskeletal injury never come back to work because it becomes permanently de debilitating for that individual. So, I mean, it, what we know when we look at the age groups of, 40, of, of 54 to 65 and then greater than 65, those are the only two age groups where the incidence of overexertion injury strain sprains are increasing each year. And part of that is that we have more um, people, 65 year olds and older in the workforce than ever before, but there's also a lot of older 50 year olds and now early 60s and they continue to work and their body just, when they get injured, they just can't heal. Or if they have the injury, uh, an injury that might happen to a 30 year old compared to that same injury to a 65 year old, it's gonna take a lot longer to rehab that in individual. And when that individual uh, comes back, he's gonna have to come back uh, more slowly. And, and, it, and there's a, a really good possibility that that person will not come back. So the aging workforce is a factor and they seem to be more susceptible to the injuries to begin with, as I mentioned, with the increase in the incident of uh, the frequency of uh, soft tissue injuries and also the overexertion and strain sprain. So that, that's, that's the first uh, group that, we're, that that's a real concern. Um, the next is the weakness. I've talked about the worker is weaker today than they were uh, 15 years ago. Our own data, we have a, over half a million of muscular strength tests in our database now. And I like to go back and look to see, well, how's that worker changing? And we measure the absolute strength of the shoulder joint. Um, so uh, I'm aware more about the shoulder than uh, 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 as far as being a very serious problem and what's happening to the shoulder. And we also measure the knee strength of the leg extensors, uh, the knee extensors, the quadricep muscle group and the hamstring group as well. So when we looked at this data comparing uh, what the worker looked like back in 2005, there's about 25,000 workers in that group compared to what they looked like in 2019, there's about 22,000 workers in that group. And we looked at it by age group. Um, basically that orange line is 2019 and that blue line is uh, 2005. And on average, the uh, upper body strength or shoulder strength for the worker today or in 2019 is 23% weaker than it was back in 2005. Now, I know, you know, the workforce or the workplace is changing with er ergonomics uh, and, and things of that sort, but many companies still have items that still weigh 30, 40, 50, 60 pounds, 80 pounds, 100 pounds, even though the job task analysis or the job description must say you must do that with a two-man lift. Uh, my experience is that there's a lot of workers who just want to get the work done and they don't wait for that second person to help out. They go to make that lift and bingo, they pop a shoulder. But the critical thing is you can see that the as the worker ages and they get uh, weaker and weaker, or they, they lose their strength, I should say, and there's a reason for that too. Um, but they... Um, that that doesn't have to happen. Muscle is made to work. Um, you stay strong, you can stay strong throughout your entire lifespan. You might lose 5% of your strength from age 30 to age 65 to 70 to 75, but you don't have to lose 20, 30, 40% of your strength um, by virtue of just staying healthy, staying physically active, and stimulating the muscle so it stays strong through weightlifting programs, things of that sort. So that's the one thing. In, in, in industry, they don't spend a lot of time teaching their workers how to stay strong. And I understand that. It's just that they're there to work. They were there to produce the widgets. But at the same time, that worker's getting weaker and weaker. And by the way, with the knee strength, 
It's about 19% weaker today than it was uh, 15 years ago. And the interesting stat here, if you look at the age group of 20 to 29, the gap between that orange line and blue line is the greatest. And wow. the difference there is more like 26 or 27%. So that younger worker that you're trying to hire into your workforce is coming in in worse condition than ever before. And that's another reason why they're so susceptible uh, to injury. And then, of course, the loss of strength as we age is another reason why we see an increase in the musculoskeletal injuries with these older workers. Mm -hmm. And then talk to us then, I guess, about the, the role that also obesity would play in this. Well, um, probably the best study that ever came out, uh, it was in 2007, was the, the Duke Medical Center um, by author named, uh, our researcher named Dr. Osterby. And he looked at the, uh, the uh, soft tissue injuries for nurses um, in, in their, their workplace. And what he saw was that the worker who had a body mass index, which is um, a BMI of 35 or more, they had two times more soft tissue injuries uh, their cost for those uh, soft tissue injuries was seven times greater, $7,000 versus $49,000, and they had 13 times more lost work days. But what we see with our data, uh, again, we don't, uh, I like to, we, we collect height and weight. We don't use body mass index in determining whether a worker can work or not, but I collect the data because it's very interesting to follow what's happening with body mass index. And there's various ways that you can, can compartmentalize BMI, but most, for the most part, a, a normal BMI is 18 to 25. Now, you, there's pluses and minuses here um, in terms of how effective BMI is, but when you get up to a BMI of 35 to 39 um, or greater, the research shows that that worker is at greater risk for injury. Um, mm -hmm. What does our data show? Um, again, the blue line is 2005 and the orange line is 2019. Um, what, our, what we see is, is typically what they see nationally today, and that is about 43% of the workforce falls under that uh, obese definition of a BMI of 30 or more. And I got to tell you that most professional basketball players have BMIs in 33, 34, 35 because they're so tall and they're so heavily muscled. So I don't get too concerned when I hear someone has a BMI of 30 or 32 or 33. But we know when you had that BMI of 35 or more, it's uh, it becomes a problem. In fact, we look at data now where we uh, look at the group of a BMI of 50, 50 and more. And we're seeing more and more people. Gary, I think we may have may have lost Tom uh, temporarily. Um, let's see. I think maybe he can call back in. However, some of the same stuff that we talk about on a, on a regular basis, especially when it comes to the lockdown, the concepts of what it is that you're supposed to do whenever you've got everybody that nobody's following by a regular diet, everybody is working from home, they're not having to get out and perform as much exercise. I mean, what, what are some of the things that you're seeing with this that obviously would play into to the scenario? Yeah, and, and he's got a couple of the points here, and I'm sh hopefully he can join us and, and go through the rest yeah. of this. But um, I, I think we've seen a, a huge, um, I interesting kind of story of the lockdown impact. And I, I know anecdotally we've heard people either taking this approach where they're eating, eating more, they're um, moving less. Um, yeah. And then we've also heard people flip the other way and take an opportunity to be uh, even healthier than they normally would be. But I do know that from the sedentary lifestyle standpoint, if you think about just the fact that you're at home now and you're not physically moving into a workspace or or always going to stores, you're just moving less. Um, I think the, da the data everybody jokes about with all of everybody's Fitbits and Apple Watches mm -hmm. is now the steps went from 10,000 steps a day to, you know, barely a thousand. Mm -hmm. So even if you work out once a day, like I, I like to lift weights, if I work out at lunch, 
I'm still not moving much throughout the day. I'm not getting up. I'm not going and walking into an office or walking around an office. And so I think there's a big impact on health um, because of this lockdown. And then the other piece that I wrote down as, as Tom was talking, um, and I'm sure you know we could go into this a little bit more, but what, what we're hearing a lot from clients is that it's not just challenging to hire healthy employees that can do the job and that this strength is decreasing. But what I hear from a lot of employers, especially in the last year, is that they're having a hard time hiring at all. And they're hiring knowing that people are less healthy and are potentially a higher risk for injury in that first year, especially. And so they're kind of going into it with that risk um, approach where they're thinking, well, we know that we probably are going to end up with some claims or people that are not um, able to perform the jobs we're asking them to perform, but the alternative is not being able to hire at all. So, um, yeah, so it's been an interesting time and, it's uh, definitely going to be uh, something that we'll keep a close eye on over the next couple of years. So I know Tom's information a little bit, so I can go through it, Holly, if you want me to. Uh, and then we can hopefully, you know, he'll join back because he has a lot of good things to say. Um, so Tom, his whole life, as he explained, has, they've done a ton of research on the value of muscle health. And they've done a research on the ability of the body to fight infection and disease. Um, we, we do see, of course, with COVID that underlying conditions and comorbidities is something that is a big deal um, because uh, Americans have become more obese and have become um, ha started to develop more and more comorbidities over the last 20 years. We are having a harder time fighting a new infection, a, a new disease like COVID-19. So one of the things that I know Dr. Cherry says a lot and a lot of the, the experts we have on here is that sometimes this actually, um, even though it's a new infection we're fighting, you sometimes have to go back to the basics with your overall health, sleep well, exercise and eat good foods um, and make sure that we're taking care of our bodies so that we can fight disease. Um, and then also, you know, Tom has on here the, the muscle loss that we've talked a little bit about over time. And then also that employer impact. And we've talked a lot about that. It's that making sure that employees are able to physically perform the jobs and mitigate injury and illness and also down the, the line at risk to claims and, and injuries. And, and we see that it is uh, compounded by this muscle health. And, and a lot of employers that are in heavy industries have work hardening programs and different programs and ways to go about this. And, and we could talk about how to manage through that. Anything else here, Holly, that you wanted to include? No, I think that that pretty much sums it up. The The next part, though, I actually is what, what gets my attention, you know, significantly, because it's like, this is where we can jump into the solution mode. What is it that we could do? What kind of um, interventions can we take? Or programs can we put in place to actually make a difference in this? And and there, I think, if I'm not mistaken, I think, did you also go go and have one of these tests done, those screening tests, the the pre hire test. Yeah, so I was extremely impressed. We did it several years ago. Um, and actually, because we partnered with, with Tom on some um, additional testing for our clients, but I was extremely impressed in the actual assessment form of what it is and how it is that they're, they're assessing these muscles and making that determination as to whether or not that you know, you definitely are able to perform the duties that would be expected of the, that individual role. So talk to us about the, maybe kind of the difference in some of these tests and, and what that impact would look like from the- from Absolutely. Career. Yeah, so, uh, and of course, Tom's the expert, so um, we'll get him back. And if not, we'll follow up with some, some more information after this. And, and I've seen a few people ask if this presentation will be available after, and it will be. And of course, Tom is a, a phenomenal expert. So we'll we'll chat with Tom anytime and, and get him on calls if we need to. But one of the things that we see with the different approaches that there are out there with um, what you see up here, there's what we call PCEs or FCEs. A PCE is a physical capacity exam and a FCE is a functional capacity exam. So a lot of people in the industry know what a functional capacity exam is and there's different names for it. There's lift tests. There's different ways of explaining it. But essentially what a physical capacity exam is, is taking somebody's job functions and making sure that if you're hiring somebody, they can perform to those job functions. And so I know one of the burning questions out there is usually a lifting 
type thing where you've got an employee that, and Tom described, you have to partner lift maybe. Um, and so if you've got in the job description that you may have to partner lift 30 pounds or you have to individually lift 30 pounds, what you want to do is put a, a new employee or, or pre-employment through those types of functions and you do that with a, with a physical therapist and it's an exam that's built based on those job descriptions. Um, typically it's a, a much more qualitative. You can see if somebody can move, but as a physical therapist, you're watching for breakdown of mechanics. You're making sure they're physically fit and able to perform those functions. What Tom's screening does is a, it's a, a um, physical capacity exam and he described that machine and it is a machine that basically measures the strength at the joints. So it's looking at shoulder strength, it's looking at knee strength, quad, hamstring strength. And what they're looking at is as you move and you're doing different repetitive motion, they're measuring the output of the strength of the, the joint. And they're measuring that against all other data they've Hello? got. Oh, there's Tom. Hey, Tom. There you are. Yeah. Hey, thank you for joining us again. Yeah, Tom, I was describing your PCEs right now, yeah, so perfect yeah. timing. Okay. I was describing what the exam looks like with a, a physical capacity exam, and I already kind of yeah. went into the, the FCE version, but I was explaining the machines and how the what the output looks like from um, a PCE versus an FCE, if you want to jump in and take over. <laughs> sure. Um, love this high-tech technical stuff. Anyways, yeah. Um, the, the, both the PCE, the physical capability evaluation and the functional capacity evaluation um, are means to evaluate the uh, strength and uh, capability of that new hire applicant. Um, and and, and uh, they're, both programs have been, uh, can demonstrate success in terms of getting the right person in the right job. And that's the the critical thing is you want to make sure that, as I said earlier, the musculoskeletal de definition fails to identify that having the right physical capability to match up against the physical demands of the job is a good way to prevent or to minimize the number of musculoskeletal disorders within your uh, company. So mm -hmm. um, both the PCE and the FCE, they're, they're, they're different. Uh, the FCE, as uh, Dara may have mentioned, uh, is objective from the standpoint of assessing the uh, amount of force you generate within a working muscle. Uh, the FCE, the functional capacity, is more work simulation. Uh, both have been around for a number of years. Uh, certainly, um, I've been doing FP PCEs since in the, the late 80s and with my own company since 1998. And the FCEs have been around since the early uh, 1990s. So they're very both f functional. And there's, um, did you get it? Did you mention anything about the legal aspect, uh, Dara? I didn't get into that one yet. Yeah. No, 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 yeah I, was, I was just starting to talk about the machines and the data yeah. that you got. No. Um, but I, yeah. I think the legality piece is, is always a, a fascinating component for me. Yeah. Right. Well, and, you know, I, uh, if you want to talk more about the machine, I'd be happy to do that. But, uh, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the legality side, I, I, no matter who you use or what you use, if you're going to do physical capability strength testing on the new air side, th there are several things you need to look at. You I mean, you, you have to be able to justify that what you do uh, actual assesses the physical demands of the job. So you have to start with the physical demands on uh, analysis. Now, a lot of companies will say, well, well we, we have that. And in reality, they don't. They have job descriptions. Um, and some are very good job descriptions, but they don't have the analysis of the physical demands of the job. And so what we're looking at, and, and these are usually done by certified ergonomists. They come into the workplace. They they follow you around to see what you're doing each uh, for for an eight hour day or ten hour day, um, and what's a typical day. And they're going to look at things such as lifting, uh, carrying, pushing, pulling, reaching, climbing, bending, stooping, all these types of physical tasks. And then how often during the course of the day do you do that? And this it's all based really off of the Department of Labor strength definitions, where you're looking at uh, jobs that can be rated anywhere from sedentary to uh, uh, light, uh, to uh, medium, 
uh, heavy and, and, and very heavy. And, and the demand of that job becomes a target score. So if you do a PCE or you do an FCE, you're going to have to test against something. And you're going to test against those physical demands, okay? So that's the first thing you have to do from a legal point of view. You have to have a defensible job task analysis on file, and it must be relatively current. Now, uh, so who, no one wants to define current, but most people are saying th three to five years. So uh, I've been in companies where they say, yeah, I've got my job task analysis and it was done in uh, 10 years ago. Well, in that period of 10 years, they've added robots to, to the plant, uh, which has taken away from the physical demands of the job. And in some cases, they've lowered the, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the weight uh, of, of a raw product, but as a result, the bags are now smaller, so they're lifting more bags um, over a period of eight hour a day. That uh, actually increases the phys physical demands of the job. So you gotta, you gotta have that job task analysis, and then you have to demonstrate that the test you do, whether it be a PCE or an FCE, is job related. So, um, you know, if, if a person's doing all upper body work in, in the plant and you're looking at leg strength, um, may not have application to what the job is, for an example. Then you have to demonstrate consistency with business necessity. Um, and the Americans Disability Act has really redefined that to say that what they're looking at there is safety. Um, the program that you put in place, again, whether it be a PCE or an FCE, is that going to impact the safety of the worker? Is that going to allow him or her to work uh, uh, more effectively with less risk for injury? Um, and so those are the three primary things. You, you got to have the, the uh, uh, physical demands analysis, you have to have job relatedness, and you have to have uh, consistency with business necessity um, to have a legitimate um, uh, a new hire physical capability strength testing program. Um, and, the, the, you know, the EEO sets up these guidelines. And, and uh, if you do this, um, and if by chance you have an EEO challenge, the probability of successfully meeting that EEO challenge is much greater than if you don't do this. So those are the legal aspects of doing new hire strength testing. Okay, and then talk to us then about the, the wellness um, strength programs that could be implemented there at the workplace. Yeah. Um, I strongly recommend this, no pun intended. Uh, and the reason is, that going back to a couple slides, that when I went blank or, or I, you lost me or something like that, um, the, the human body by nature loses 30 to 35% of its muscle mass from age 30, yes, yes, age 30. 30 to age 65 to 70, then it continues right after that. Um, that doesn't have to happen, as I was saying when, when you lost me. Uh, that doesn't have to happen if we maintain a healthier muscle mass through weight training, that kind of thing. Um, and just what we, the American College of Sports and Medicine now is doing strength testing uh, research studies on 80 and 90 year olds and we're demonstrating that even that 80-year-old and 90-year-old can get stronger if you stimulate the muscle. That's critical. And so you basically have to have resistance to stimulate the muscle, whether it be a weight, a stretch band, or, or whatever it might be, doing a push-up, doing a pull-up, whatever it might be. You have to stimulate the muscle. I know people that go to the fitness center and they pick up a one-pound weight and they do that 20, 30, 40 times, and they're not really doing much of anything. I can tell you that much. Um, you're not stimulating the muscle with that. It's not going to get stronger. Uh, it, we, we don't care if it gets bigger because that generally that's not the important thing. You can get stronger without increasing the girth of your muscle. So you have to do something to stimulate that muscle to maintain that strength to help you prevent the injuries from occurring within your workplace. So. You know, I've talked to a number of companies and they say, oh, I don't know how to do that. I mean, we, we, we have breaks, yeah, but, but we can't mandate and, 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 and things of this sort. And that's true. So perhaps you can do that by coming up with a program for 10 minutes in the morning, 10 minutes in the afternoon or during the shift. I know some companies are doing warm up to work programs, they're doing stretching programs, all very effective, all very good, but it may, they're not going to impact 
the strength of that muscle, which is what we're trying to do. So th th this is what we're hoping for. And the education side is this. What we know about muscle health today in the prevention of disease, most people think, yeah, I got to get stronger or have flexibility so I don't get injured. And that's important. But the research on, on what uh, healthy muscle mass does in terms of helping you to maintain or manage certain critical lifestyle diseases such as diabetes, cardiovascular disease, hypertension, and now certain cancers. They're, they're showing people who have a healthier, healthier muscle mass, 13 different cancers, you, the greater, the, 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 the healthier your muscle mass, the greater your survivability is by as much as 43%. And in fact, the Cancer Society is now include uh, strength training during the treatment of some cancers so that you can at least stay strong as you go through your cancer treatment. So muscle is not just critical to the injury prevention, but it's to our health and, and, and long-term health as well. So I encourage people to get involved with, with these strength programs, particularly in industry. And can we go to the, the next slide? The, the difference is that when you do a, 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 a new higher physical capability strength test or, or a functional capacity test, there are certain things you have to do, as shown on this slide here to the right-hand side. It, um, you have to have the job task analysis. You have to have that. You have to have a document to, to establish pass-fail. Um, the company receives the outcomes when you do an NFCE or a PCE, um, and it's usually billed on a per-test basis. But when you do wellness testing, that you cannot mandate that. Whereas with new hires, you can mandate that. It's part of the screening process, becoming an employee within our company. You have to have uh, this new hire strength test. But for wellness programs, you cannot mandate it unless you have a federally re regulated company uh, or, or uh, a job such as a uh, over-the-road truck driver uh, requiring a CDL license. It's federally regulated, so they can also say you have to have a strength test every single year along or every two years along with your, your DOT exam. And the results uh, from a wellness eval strength evaluation goes back to the individual, not to the company. It's like a health risk appraisal, and the company therefore gets a um, an aggregate report, but the, the individual himself will get the results. These are usually done via uh, in, uh, health plans, uh, employee health benefit plans, where they give them incentives. If you do certain amount of things to enhance your health, one of being your muscle health, you're going to have a lower deductible, for an example. So that those are um, that, that that's a critical thing in terms of uh, offering uh, uh, muscular strength training programs for your workforce via a wellness program. You cannot mandate it. Okay, Tom. There has been a ton of questions that have came through. We have some that are that are for the town hall, but then we also have some that that were brought in by the audience. Um, just kind of run through these. Quickly, let's see. So sure. Kevin was asking, are you aware of any new treatment trends for sprain injuries? And is early intervention still the biggest driver for decreasing the recovery duration? Well, in answer to the second question, the answer is yes. The, or the earliest you can get involved, the earlier you can get involved, the, the quicker the, re, the recovery. Absolutely. Um, I, I was talking to our athletic trainer today and I said to answer this question, Holly and uh, Dara, and I said, well, so what are the latest treatments? And it's, there's a lot of gadgets, but they all do the same thing in terms of treatment. If you have a strain or a sprain, you, you put ice on it for uh, several days to allow that blood to dissipate, to get the swelling down, and then the treatment can begin. And when the treatment begins, they generally then put heat on it. Uh, he said the only thing that's probably the latest thing that you see a lot, particularly in athletes, uh, if you're watching basketball game, gymnastics or football, whatever it is, is this uh, kinesio tape. And they'll put a, a strip, uh, you'll see a, a long band of tape on a certain part of the body. And that's helped to stabilize the body and to protect that part of the body. So uh, other than that, it's it's the same strat same uh, principles uh, in terms of the treatment of a strain or a sprain ha hasn't changed. It just takes time. Some people, it's going to be uh, uh, d done a lot more qu quickly. Uh, they'll go from cold to heat much faster. Others are going to be cold for a lot longer because they have too much swelling and so forth. So that's that, that's what's happening there. Yeah. Hey, and I saw a question that came in a while ago. I was going to try to look at what it was, but I think, I, yeah, here it is. Can you talk about the impact of smoking in relation to healing, especially with bones or surgery? 
I know a little bit about that. Um, Dara, you may know more about that than me, but it does impact it from a negative point of view. So smoking, um, uh, mm -hmm. it, it just what the, the nicotine does to the muscle and things of that sort, it will uh, slow the healing process. Uh, it doesn't prevent it, but it does slow the healing process, yes. Yeah, definitely. All right, let's see. The next one that we came across was from Randy. What type of impact are employers seeing if we start a new new higher strength screening program and then are the number of work-related injuries decreasing? Also, they're asking, would that be like a drug screen where you would be uh, passing, they'd be required to pass before they were able to accept the position? The answer is yes to all of those. <laughs> so... Um, <laughs> Next question. No, just kidding. Um, yes, um, I, I, I've been doing this for a number of years, as, as you know, Holly and Dara, and all of our clients realize a, a, a significant reduction in uh, musculoskeletal disorders, soft tissue injuries, particularly to the shoulders, to the knees, and ironically to the low back. And I'll tell you why, because there's a physiological anatomical connection between the shoulder and the low back. You keep your shoulders strong, you will prevent most low back strain sprains. Uh, and, and I won't go into all the research on that, but we, we certainly see that with our data and the research studies point that out as well. The shoulder is the most critical joint in, in the body. So, um, and will you see therefore a reduction in, in these injuries in the frequency and also not only just the frequency, but also the uh, length of time of days away from work as, as well. And uh, it is like a drug screen from the standpoint, you can mandate it and you can offer that, for, this is post job offer and you offer them the job based contingent on passing a physical demands evaluation or a physical capability evaluation. Uh, and if not, then they withdraw that conditional offer if they don't meet that up front. And Tom, so right simple. before, well, well, sorry, Holly, while you were um, off on your little mini vacation, um, <laughs> one of the things I was, I was talking about with Holly was that we are hearing um, from a lot of clients that the struggle right now is these programs are really great programs, but right now we're in a situation where um, often they're not hiring fast enough. There's a, uh, not enough workers to supply the, the demand that these employers are facing. And so often what they're doing, in, at least in this last year or very recently, is they're hiring knowing that there's potentially a greater risk for injury. So it's kind of even going into it eyes wide open, knowing that they're hiring for these potential injuries or for these potential risks out there, but not being able to staff enough employees. So it, it's, it's a really challenging workplace right now for employers, especially with uh, a lot of our health and safety professionals. W w and they know this stuff inside and out, but and they're going into it with eyes wide open, but they're struggling because they just can't hire fast enough. And uh, Dara, absolutely. I agree with you 100%. What we see what's happening with some of our clients, as you may know, when you do, when you set the standard, when you do a job task analysis, and let's say the job comes back as a heavy job, um, the, the company... I'm going to say by law, but uh, but you, you don't want to violate the EEO. But when it says that the physical demands of the job is a heavy, you can't set the standard higher than that, i.e. up to, say, very heavy. But you have every right to say, okay, the job is heavy, but I'm going to lower it to a medium heavy or a medium or even a light medium during this period of time while I'm having difficulty finding workers. So at least you're doing some screening uh, out, and you might be screening out instead of uh, – 10% of the workforce, you'll only be screening out two or 3% of the workforce. And it's usually those two or three that's gonna account for almost 80% of your injuries and costs. So uh, I encourage uh, companies to, if you do physical capability testing, to continue, but to lower the standard because by law you can, and at least uh, have an impact on, on, on weeding out those that are gonna have the, the, the greatest impact on your uh, um, injury rates. That's a great sure. point, um, really great point. And I think the other thing they they are doing is um, maybe if they're hiring to the lower um, job task, that or if it, you know the lower level, that they're making sure that they're not um, that they're maybe decreasing the requirements of some of the lifts and some of the the job demands, or making sure they're evaluating that on a regular basis. Maybe not official restrictions, but making sure that they're helping employees do the right thing and and they're preventing Absolutely. some of those those injuries. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. uh, yes. Correct. Mm -hmm. For sure. Yeah. Then we have two more. Let's see. 
And Scott, I see your question about the 80 pound lifts. And so we will follow up with you to get you some of that specific information afterwards. Um, let's see, Rayleigh had asked, uh, the majority of our employees continue to work from home as we all are as well. Um, what type of mu muscle strength exercises would be most appropriate for the home environment? Um, well, the good news is there's a, there's quite a uh, few you can be doing. You can just use your body weight, for an example, going back to your old high school days when you were forced to do push-ups and pull-ups and sit-ups and stuff like that. Uh, that certainly stimulates the muscle. Um, and then it's if, if you can afford it, you can go to a, a, a store and, and buy these stretch bands. They're not expensive. They may be $10, $12. Um, and some people will buy, the, the, and you can get different color bands. Uh, so, so the, the color will determine the amount of resistance and they're safe to use. And the kids can use them as well. You can make to do some fun things. Um, and some people will go out and actually invest in weights, uh, kettlebells and uh, dumbbells and things of that sort. Uh, if you do, I encourage you to start with lighter weights. And, you know, and that's not going against what I'm saying about simulating a muscle, but you don't want to just jump in and start lifting 30, 40, 50, 60 pounds because you might get hurt. So there are a number of things you, you can do at home. And the other thing, and I don't know where, where depending on where these, uh, your, your uh, viewers live, um, myself, I'm 77 years of age. I love working in the yard, and I, I use that as an opportunity to get my physical activity in, and to do physically demanding jobs around my yard, which helps stimulate the muscle as, as well. Yeah, and I think that Matt had commented on on the value of nutrition and training people to eat well. I mean, I think that that plays a huge piece in, in the recovery impact as well on what it is Absolutely. that you and how, how fast you get back. Yeah, all right, one more question uh, before we wrap up then. Leslie had asked, um, would a prior strain or strain increase the likelihood of future injury and would that history be reviewed within a new higher screening test it's a good question uh and answer the second part the answer is yes uh for example uh like when we do the evaluation i'm, I'm sure other groups that do, do the evaluation you, you have the right to ask that question is there anything i need to know that's going to uh impact your safety while performing the uh, new higher strength evaluation so you have the right to ask that um, and I will tell you that not everyone tells you the truth on that because we've seen that happen and we look at the data that we get on that person and we can see that they had a pre-existing condition. Then when we get back to them and say, you know, it looks like you had an old shoulder injury or old knee injury. Oh, yeah, that happened two or three years ago. So, but you do have the right to ask that question. <clears throat> and then um, would a prior strain or sprain uh, increase your likelihood of a future uh, injury? You know, if you have great rehabilitation, or a good reconditioning program to get that joint and muscle strong again, the answer is it should not. But please keep in mind that whenever you injure a body part, that injury is with you for the rest of your life and you never know when it's gonna come back. So I encourage people who do, who do get injured to just don't say, oh, I'm ignored, I'll just sit at home and put some ice on it and I'll get better in uh, a week or 10 days. Get, get it appropriately assessed, get to the right physical therapy group and, and, and let them stimulate that and let them recondition that so you can get that that uh, joint back to where it was prior to the injury or even even better than it was prior to the injury. Definitely. Yeah, I think that we could squeeze in this one question that goes along with that, which was everyone was asking um, whether the weather could impact what that, that impact would be on your muscles there. So I hear, you know, you commonly hear people talking about their arthritis is acting up, you know, if it's, if it's going to start raining or something like that. Is there any truth to those, those types of claims? Oh, absolutely. Um, th that's another whole area of exercise physiology. You're talking about uh, working in heat, you're working in cold. Uh, United Airlines is, is one of our clients and you look at their ramp workers. You got Chicago where you're, you're dealing with uh, winters that are horrible. You got Houston, Texas, where you guys are. And uh, during the summer, it's, uh, you know, uh, heat indexes in, in the hundreds uh, and, and so forth. So, yes, I mean, we have clients that were workers work in coolers all day or freezers all day. And so that certainly impacts the muscle, the consistency of the muscle and the susceptibility to injury as far as a soft tissue injuries is concerned. Heat obviously is loosens up the muscle. There's less chance of an injury occurring than it would in a colder in environment. Yeah. 
awesome information. Guys, Dara and, and um, Tom, both of you, you had great information. I appreciate you coming and joining us today. Now we're kind of running late here on time. Um, so I'll go ahead and just kind of wrap this up here. Obviously, if you have additional questions, please don't hesitate. You know, you can send them to us. You can put them right here in the platform. We'll respond to you from there. Have a rep, uh, reach out to you, et cetera. So if there's anything that we can answer for you, please don't hesitate to, to uh, reach out and ask those questions. Again, if you haven't already, there, you know, please click on that on that button to register for the next one. I know that that um, September 11th is a is a day that sticks in all of our heads, and so it would be nice to kind of revisit some of that and look at look at the positive aspect of, of what it is that we can do to help in these scenarios. So get registered. We thank you for joining us, and we look forward to seeing you then on September the 9th at one o'clock p.m. Central. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye now. Thank you. Appreciate it.